All right, uh, the economy on fire or looking more fired up. Uh, as you heard, about 4.1% growth here. Uh, that a lot of people thinking at the very least will average out the year 3%, a little bit better growth. I haven't seen that in a lot of years. The Council of Economic Advisors Chairman Kevin Hassett with us right now. Mr. Chairman, very good to have you. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Now. Um, so uh, this was greeted with some disappointment, oddly enough, from some who had, <laughs> were buying even whisper numbers. It was going to be a lot higher. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised, happy, what? Oh, yeah, we're very, very happy because, remember, the president promised that his policies would deliver 3 percent growth. And, you know, now we're looking at 4. And at the CEA, we put out a forecast for this year. You might recall last fall, I think you and I talked about it, that it'd be 3.1. And at the time that we put that out last year, then there was a lot of criticism from the left that 3 percent is impossible. Well, if you average the first two quarters, it's 3.1. But most importantly, you mentioned that people thought maybe we'd see 5 percent growth or something. Uh, but one of the things, the nuances in the data that's really striking and is very favorable for the second half of the year is the inventory subtracted about a whole percentage point from the GDP number. And so what happened was instead of producers being able to keep up with consumer demand and increase their production as the surge in their demand for their products uh, occurred, uh, you know, they had to run down their inventories. And historically, when that happens, then they have to jack up production in the second half of the year uh, to rebuild their stocks. And so, you know, it's about as positive a report as you can get because it suggests that you're going to have sustained growth. All right, thank you for explaining the inventory thing, because that, that just, we got a lock on the Nielsen's with that puppy. Uh, oh, but, yeah, yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a joking. Nielsen I'm machine, Neil, come on. Yeah. I'm just joking. With you. But you did talk about something that's a legitimate issue that economists have been debating, that maybe the, it does set the stage for stronger, at least than expected growth in the second half of the year. What sure. are you looking at? It absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, you know, we said it'd be 3.1 percent this year. The first half averaged exactly 3.1. It's a little spooky, right, when your models work that well. But we've got a lot more momentum going into the second half than we anticipated. And so I would guess that the next time that we write down our forecast for the year, that it'll go up a couple of tenths. So, so absolutely, we're yeah. looking at an enormous amount of momentum. Uh, there's a heck of a lot of reshoring activity. You saw that. Uh, net exports actually contributed positively to GDP growth in the second quarter. And so there's a lot yeah, what of did you really think that was about? A lot of it was driven by uh, net exports up, particularly mm -hmm. a lot of agriculture related products and all. A lot of people could be, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to get the deals done and the shipments out before these tariffs sure. came into effect. So, in a weird way, the president's hard line on trade boosted that number. It boosted those sales. And, and I think that there are two factors, really. One is what you said. And so, you know, we've looked at uh, data, private data on inventories. And we see that, for example, the Chinese increased their inventories of soybeans a lot, perhaps in anticipation of, of some kind of trade dispute. But also, there's a lot of reshoring of activity because the U.S. has become a really attractive tax uh, climate again. And so we see that in the data as well. Um, you know, I noticed that we're the president, of course, and you, you mentioned in your, your comments on the White House today, about what's happening on the trade run, and the trade deficit did mm -hmm. dip a little bit in the latest period here. But the fact of the matter is, year over year, it's still worse than it was. Mm -hmm. But it's still a fraction, if you think about it, concerned to the budget deficit. The president never mentions the budget deficit. We're looking at a trillion dollar one this year, likely a trillion dollar one next year. Does he care about it, mm -hmm. talk to you about it? Oh, he sure does. And, and I disagree that he never mentions it. In fact, you might recall that when he saw the spending deal that he was uh, you know, very pleased to see the military spending he wanted, but was concerned that perhaps there was too much uh, other spending in but the budget. But he still signed and I'm very sure, he still signed well, well, I think it was because really, you know, there's such a problem with the military spending. It had fallen so far behind right. under President Obama that he had a lot of catching up to do. But I would guess that in the next uh, budget negotiation that he, we're going to have to draw a much harder line on spending. That's right. But you'd have to draw it with your Republicans, right? Because they're the ones who are spending like drunk sailors, right? The, the president has to sign it. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. So let me get a sense from you what you're going to do to address that. Now, a lot of Democrats mm -hmm. sees on the tax cuts is the reason why it got worse. They ignore the fact, and I know right, you've mentioned false. the past, yeah. that it, mm -hmm. there's a lot of spending that went into that that no one has bemoaned, I think, it, by another $10, 11 trillion dollars over the next decade. Leaving that aside, though, um, Republicans have this reputation for being the party of austerity, watching this stuff. But mm -hmm. you're going into the midterms, you know, advocating, you know, nothing of the sort. Well, you know, I think that if you look at the president's budget, you see that you know, there's a heck of a lot more spending restraint uh, than you saw in the budget deal this year. You know, and I think we have a much better economy. Wait, wait, so we're still looking at a proposal that budget. caused more 
trillion dollars more in spending right. the money coming in. So how no, is that no, you're right, and, and, and you're you're exactly right. But 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 ahead of the the you know spending like drunken sailors Congress that you mentioned, you know there's restraint and there's definitely going to be more coming forward in the future. Are you worried that a backup in interest rates though is still in the offing and maybe this great report today, Chairman? Con Oop, there we there we went. It was a great question. Oh, he's back. He's back. I, I, I thought the president had just unplugged the camera. Um, but Wait, oh, what anyway, happened? No, you're back with us, and I'm so happy I'm to back. see you again. Okay. I'm Neil. Yes. Good to see you. It's great um, to be back. Oh, yeah, very good. <laughs> uh, Chair, when I was asking about the uptick in rates that was boosted in large part mm -hmm. by this very good GDP report, that good mm -hmm. news could be working against you. It keeps the Federal Reserve hiking rates. I know the president is not a fan of that. What do you think of that? Well, I, I, you know, I respect the independence of the Fed, and I know that the people of the Fed will do what they think is right. Well, do you agree and with the president that it, it seems to exasperate him? Well, well, I think that at a time of high economic growth, what you want to do is see, is the growth coming because of a surge in demand or a surge in supply? If it's coming from a surge in demand, then that can be inflationary and put a lot of excess pressure on the Fed. But what we see right now is a capital spending boom that increases supply and doesn't put a lot of upward pressure on prices. And so I expect the Fed will do whatever's right. But I think that I'm encouraged by the fact that we have high growth and high capital spending because that means we're getting a supply driven surge. You know, Jeremy, we talked a little bit about the deal mm -hmm. that was made with the Europeans, but I'll be darned if I can get the specifics on that. Maybe you can show them. With me. I know they're committed <laughs> to buying more soybeans, to buying more like natural gas. When we get the ability to get it out mm -hmm. at more port facilities and all to get the, to the Europeans, what have you. But do we have hard numbers to go on and, and what kind of commitments they're talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. There have been a lot of discussions behind the scene and an acceptance that we need to move towards a zero, zero equilibrium where, you know, they don't close their market star products. There are no tariffs, no non-tariff barriers. Uh, those conversations will be ongoing. But, you know, we're very, very pleased with the progress that we've made when so far. When you say we're pleased with the progress, we don't have a deal yet, though. If you look at trade, you know, I'm just an economist, not a trade negotiator, right? But, but if you look at these trade deals, they tend to take a while to negotiate because you got to let the lawyers in the room. I know no, it's not no, something we economists want to do. No, no, I understand that, sir, but we had a similar other. promise and commitment yeah. in April of this year with the Chinese, and, and that went like one of my diet commitments. It just went away. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, like, will this one go away? And Are there any no, teeth in it? Yeah, there are teeth. And, and, and again, it's a deal that the president personally negotiated uh, with Juncker and the president's well, What did he negotiate? What, how many more soybeans are that? How many more uh, liquid <laughs> uh, natural gas contracts are the Europeans committed to buy? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, those are the things that you should ask Ambassador Lighthizer on the show to okay. explain. Look, not, it seems to me progress. like it, we, that's the commitment, but no one is given any particulars. Am I right? Uh, I think there probably are more particulars than are public. Okay. Uh, finally, your sense. I know you don't mm -hmm. like to focus on the markets. I know the president will talk about the markets. There's a great concern that the technology mm -hmm. run up. Uh, this is outside your purview, and I grant that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that it might be running out of steam. Uh, that the, the, the money and the commitment to, to, to keep this going just might be there. Are people getting tired or they're running out of energy? Uh, do you worry about that? Because that could show up in the stuff that you police. Well, you're absolutely right that there are going to be ebbs and flows in markets. But, you know, if you look at sort of like a five year or 10 year horizon, which is where you've always advised that investors look right and smoothing through the ups and downs, what matters is are we growing 3% or are we growing 2%? And if we're growing 3%, there's going to be so much earnings growth that you don't have to really worry about the kind of disruptions that you see, you know, happen on a firm by firm basis right now. But for, you know, absolutely the market can get ahead of itself. But if you get the growth that we think that we're seeing, then the economy will catch up. Kevin Hassett, a real pleasure. Thank you for taking Thanks. the time. Thanks. Great to be here. Have a busy day.